Welcome to the Fundamentals Lecture for Chem 118, Experiment 5. During this experiment, we're going to be looking at what happens when we have non-one-to-one -one reactions in the organic chemistry laboratory, and how sometimes this has a dramatic effect on how we design our synthesis. So we're going to talk about a few topics today. We're going to start off with a little bit of backstory and discuss the ultraviolet spectrum. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what it is about organics that causes them to absorb in the UV. Then we'll get down to business with the crossed aldol condensation reaction. We'll review that mechanism and we'll discuss some of the finer points of predicting the products in these kinds of reactions that have non one to one ratios. The question we'll be asking ourselves this week is this How does the order of addition affect the products that are obtained in non one to one reactions? meaning reactions with a stoichiometry that's imbalanced and therefore can result in the formation of different products. For example, the benzyl acetone and dibenzyl acetone, which can be formed in the reaction of benzaldehyde with acetone. This will be the topic that we'll discuss today. But first, let's get ready for a job interview. We found this advertisement recently in a newspaper. Vandalay Industries is looking for someone to get into the sunblock market with them. So they need a good chemist who understands the absorption of light. And it looks like the compensation's pretty good. So we're going to apply for this job. But before we show up for that interview, let's learn a little bit about what it takes to formulate a sunblock and how molecules that go into them can be rationally designed. So let's discuss the ultraviolet spectrum. What I've shown you here is what's known as the near UV spectrum. It's called this because it's nearest to visible light, starting at about 220 nanometers and stretching to about 400 nanometers, at which point light starts to become visible to the naked eye. Within the near ultraviolet spectrum, there are three subregions: the UVC, UVB, and the UVA regions. The UVC region is designated because it's absorbed by atmospheric gases in the upper atmosphere, so it never reaches the surface of the Earth in quantities great enough to be of concern. UVB radiation, however, does reach the surface of the Earth and is known to cause sunburn and also contribute to the risk of skin cancer. UVA radiation was divided from UVB because for the longest time it was thought that it was Un, and it was not unsafe to be exposed to UVA radiation. This is because it does not cause sunburn. However, recent research has demonstrated that UVA radiation can and does contribute to the risk of skin cancers. So all three of these subclasses of ultraviolet radiation can be dangerous to humans if they're exposed to it. So any sunblock formulation that we put together is going to have to consider how we're going to protect humans from all three of these. What causes organic molecules to absorb ultraviolet light? Well, there are actually many different mechanisms that can result in the absorption of ultraviolet light. But one of the more common examples in the organic chemistry laboratory is the presence of conjugated pi systems. You'll notice that in this example I've used 1,3-butadiene, 1,3,5-hexatriene, and 1,3,5,7-octatetriene as examples of conjugated organic molecules. You'll also notice that the maximum absorption wavelength of each of these is increasing as I increase the number of pi bonds. 1,3-butadiene absorbing at 212 nanometers, 1,3,5-hexatriene at 256 nanometers, and 1,3,5,7-octatetriene at 281 nanometers. So what is it that's causing these compounds to absorb ultraviolet light, and why is there such a pattern? Well, we can see a simple example of the pattern if we look at two of the simpler pi bond containing compounds available to us. Ethylene, shown on the left of the slide here, and 1,3-butadiene, shown on the right. Anytime that we have a pi bond or system of pi bonds within organic molecules, they form a set of molecular orbitals. And the number of molecular orbitals formed is equal to the number of atomic p orbitals which are contributing to them. 
So in the case of ethylene, which has a single pi bond and therefore two p orbitals contributing, we get two different pi orbitals. One we call the pi 1 or psi 1, and the other pi 2 or psi 2. And populating these orbitals with the two electrons in the pi bond demonstrates that the psi 1 molecular orbital is the highest occupied, and psi 2 is the lowest unoccupied. Now let's take a look at 1,3-butadiene. You'll notice that in the case of 1,3-butadiene, there are actually four p orbitals contributing to the pi system. Therefore, we'll have four molecular orbitals in that pi system, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, and psi 4. We also will have four total pi electrons. So filling these molecular orbitals in order of lowest to highest energy gives us the psi 2 as the highest occupied molecular orbital and psi 3 as the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Now here's the important part. Notice that the energy gap between the molecular orbitals on the frontier is smaller when there are more pi bonds present. This is the transition that occurs during the strongest absorption for these compounds. When a photon of appropriate energy strikes ethylene, an electron is promoted from psi 1 to psi 2. When it strikes a molecule of 1,3-butadiene, an electron transitions from psi 2 to psi 3. But that requires less energy, so it requires a photon of lower energy or longer wavelength. And this trend continues as we increase the conjugation of molecules further. Now let's consider a little mnemonic here, which allows us to better demonstrate the differences in energies between molecular orbitals of pi systems. Let's start with the simplest possible pi bond containing organic compound, ethene. To determine the energy between the molecular orbitals in that pi system, I first draw a semicircle and I make the diameter of that semicircle equal to 4 beta. Next I'm going to place two false atoms on the circle, one at the top and one at the bottom. Now I'm going to take the number of atoms involved in pi bonding and I'm going to space them about that semicircle so that they are equidistant. In this case I have two, so my diagram will look something like this. At this point, if I designate the middle energy right through the center of that circle as alpha, I can calculate an energy difference between the two based upon alpha and beta. I can also populate these molecular orbitals using the two pi electrons from ethene. So if I do this, I can determine my frontier molecular orbital energy differences. Of course, with two electrons, the HOMO is the first, psi 1, and the LUMO is psi 2. And the difference in their energies can be easily calculated. Now, let's consider the frontier molecular orbital energy differences in a slightly more conjugated compound. Let's try 1,3-butadiene. Going through the same exercise, I'll draw my semicircle place my false atoms at the top and my four atoms around the circumference at equal spacing. Again, a little bit of trigonometry allows me to determine the relative energies of each of those molecular orbitals. And using the four electrons from the pi system, I can populate those molecular orbitals to determine where the frontier is, in this case between psi 2 and psi 3. But using this mnemonic, I can calculate the relative energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMO. And in this case, it turns out to be less than that of ethene. Again, a demonstration of exactly why it is that 1,3-butadiene absorbs at a longer wavelength than does ethene. So let's think again about how we're going to formulate this sunblock, knowing what we now know about extension of conjugation and its effect on the absorption of organic compounds. As I mentioned previously, UVC is not really a concern to us because it's absorbed by the molecule ozone. Ozone is naturally present in upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere, and therefore we don't need to add anything to our sunblock formulation to prevent it from reaching our customer's skin. 
because Mother Nature has taken care of that for us. You'll also notice that ozone only has a few pi electrons, and so it's naturally going to absorb at a very, very short wavelength because it requires a relatively large energy to bridge the homo-lumo energy gap. In the case of UVB protection, there are some formulation ingredients available for us. One example of this is para-aminobenzoic acid, also known as PABA. The lambda max for this compound is about 282 nanometers, longer than that of ozone because it has a larger pi system. In the 1970s and 80s, sunblock formulations advertised that they were formulated with PABA because it was believed then that UVB was the most dangerous form of UV radiation and PABA blocked the UVB. However, a small amount of the population is allergic to this uh, compound and so currently octocrylene is a more popular choice. Its structure is shown here on the bottom left. And as you can see, it also has a much larger conjugation than does ozone. The final consideration is UVA protection, because we know now that that's one of the more dangerous forms of ultraviolet light. Commonly what you'll find in U.S. sunblock formulations is the molecule avobenzone, shown here. And I've obtained a transmittance spectrum from the literature, which means, remember, that the lower you are on the spectrum here, the greater the absorbance is for this molecule. So in this case, avobenzone, you can see, absorbs a very broad spectrum of wavelengths, particularly those in the UVA region. And I'm going to challenge you now to think about this. The avobenzone molecule that I've drawn has an sp3 carbon located right here, which disrupts the conjugation of the system. So why is it that avobenzone absorbs at a lambda max of 3, while things like PABA and octocrylene absorb at much shorter wavelengths? So we've got our proposed sunblock formulation, including ozone to take care of the UVC, that's free, Mother Nature provides it, paraaminobenzoic acid to absorb in the UVB region, and avobenzone to absorb in the UVA. So we go to our interview, we meet with the president who says, that's great, but I have a concern. Apparently there's a little bit of, of bandwidth there that you haven't quite got covered. That 300 to 350 nanometer region is a little bit thin. And the VP of Research and Development happens to be there as well and says, well, we have some benzaldehyde and acetone left over in the factory. Is there anything you can do with that? Well, in this case, there is. Well, the raw materials that we've been offered are not adequate as a sunblock additive. Take the example of benzaldehyde. It's not conjugated enough to absorb at the wavelengths necessary to complete our formulation. It also tends to have a very strong aroma of cherries and evaporates fairly quickly from the skin. So in none of these cases are we talking about something that would work well as a sunblock additive. But having acetone available gives us an opportunity to convert that benzaldehyde into something different, a molecule known as dibenzalacetone. And this molecule, although we haven't got its uh, lambda max for you here, clearly has a lambda max which is longer than that of benzaldehyde. This is because the conjugation has been extended. So now we're left asking the question, can we use the acetone and benzaldehyde after all to create a molecule which absorbs in a higher, uh, longer wavelength? We're going to accomplish this in the lab this week using a reaction known as the aldol condensation. In this case, we'll be reacting a molecule of acetone with two molecules of benzaldehyde to create our final product. This is a mock-up of the reaction in which acetone and benzaldehyde first react to create benzalacetone and water. That benzalacetone then reacts with another molecule of benzaldehyde in basic conditions to form dibenzalacetone and another molecule of water. These reactions are irreversible, so it's possible to create dibenzalacetone in large quantities. But because the stoichiometry of the reaction is 2 to 1, we have to be careful about how much of each reagent we use. 
To better understand why the aldol condensation is irreversible in this case, let's take a look at the mechanism. Here's a molecule of acetone. We've also got a molecule of uh, benzaldehyde, and we've got a hydroxide ion present. So, we have all the ingredients necessary for a crossed aldol condensation. Now, the most acidic proton is here on the acetone molecule. And in this case, the pKa of that proton is about 20. It's not terribly acidic, but it's also not uh, completely stuck on there to where it won't ever come off. So, in the presence of hydroxide, a small amount of this proton will be removed. And when this takes place, we create a new anion and a water molecule, the pKa of which is 16, less acidic. So this is a disfavored equilibrium, but it's only disfavored by a small amount. So it is possible to create a small amount of this deprotonated acetone in solution using hydroxide. And from that point forward, as it reacts away, Le Chatelier takes care of the rest. It continues to feed us the necessary reactive form of acetone. In step two, the carbanion that's been created is going to attack the most electrophilic thing it can find. So let's bring that benzaldehyde molecule closer. We know where the most nucleophilic site is. Now where's the most electrophilic site in this system? It's right there on the benzaldehyde. So we're going to have an exchange of electrons. And in doing so, We're going to create a new tetrahedral intermediate. In step three, water is going to protonate this newly created beta hydroxy ketone. The beta hydroxy ketone is so named because there is a hydroxy group and a ketone group, which are two carbons away, hence the beta. So beta refers to the two bond distance, hydroxy refers to the OH group, and of course ketone to the carbonyl. In some aldol condensations, the beta hydroxy ketone is the finishing point, but in our case, it's not. In the final step of our reaction, we're going to have an E2 elimination take place, which will create a new pi bond connecting the carbonyl and the aromatic ring in resonance. This also regenerates our hydroxide catalyst, which can react with another acidic hydrogen from the newly formed benzyl acetone molecule. So we have a second iteration primed to begin at this point. One of the things that makes this reaction so interesting is that acetone's pKa is about 20 and that benzyl acetone, which then acts as the reagent in the second step, also has a pKa of about 20. So each of these steps proceeds at roughly the same speed, since the concentrations of acetone and benzyl acetone will be somewhere in the same neighborhood as one another, and their reactivities are similar. This can make it a little bit complicated to try to get all benzyl acetone or all dibenzyl acetone from the reaction depending upon which reagents are available and which are abundant. So let's consider what happens when we add a lot of benzaldehyde to the mixture. We have a starting condition that looks something like this. And as the reaction proceeds, we would assume that there's enough benzaldehyde present that we will completely saturate all of the reactive sites on acetone with the benzaldehyde. So if we had a large excess of benzaldehyde, it would be easy to convert all the acetone into benzyl acetone. In a second scenario, let's consider what happens when we have acetone in large excess. With acetone in large excess, it's very unlikely that any two benzaldehyde molecules will find the same acetone to react with. So as the reaction progresses, we would expect that the predominant product is going to be benzyl acetone, not dibenzyl acetone. So here we can control the product that we achieve 
based upon which reagent we use in excess. But what happens when the reagent that we need in excess is not available in excess because of cost or some other concern? At that point, we have to turn to a more carefully designed synth uh, synthetic apparatus. So in short, we can control which ratio of products form in a reaction like this one based upon two factors. The first one, of course, is the relative rates of each reaction step. If one's much faster than the other, the system becomes easier to control. But when they're both very similar, we have the possibility of making a mixture of products. But the second ingredient is the relative amount of each reagent that's being used. Where equal amounts can create a mixture of product compounds, we know that using large excesses or large deficiencies can change the identity of the primary product of the reaction. We're going to be using that this week in lab. In laboratory this week, we're going to be investigating the effect of adding one reagent to another and vice versa. It turns out that in the case of one-to-one -one reactions, this is rarely a concern. But when we have two-to-one reactions or any non-stoichiometrically equivalent reaction, there's a possibility that adding one reagent to the other can actually change the ratio of products that are formed. And we're out to prove this with our experiment this week. This week we'll be running an aldol condensation reaction like the one that we've been looking at so far between acetone and benzaldehyde. But you and your partner will make one slight change to the reaction. One of you will be adding acetone solution to benzaldehyde solution with vigorous stirring through a separatory funnel. The other will be adding benzaldehyde solution to acetone solution with vigorous stirring also through a separatory funnel. So as the dropwise addition takes place, the concentration of the solution being added will remain low throughout the reaction, even though we're adding equal amounts. And based upon our previous discussion, it should be clear which ratio of products we expect or how we expect that ratio to change. This is our goal this week in lab. To give you a better perspective on what it is that we're doing here, let's say first that we're adding benzaldehyde to acetone. Our expectation is that with a large concentration of acetone in the flask and a very small concentration of benzaldehyde at any given point, that we'll see more of the singly functionalized molecules forming because we're essentially artificially keeping that benzaldehyde concentration low by adding it slowly enough that the previously added drop has already reacted away before the next reaction takes place. Now let's turn the tables. And instead, we're going to add acetone to benzaldehyde dropwise. So now the benzaldehyde is present in large abundance and the acetone is being added slowly. So we're artificially depressing the concentration of acetone in the mixture, allowing each small aliquot of acetone to react completely before adding the next. In this case, we expect a very different ratio of products to form. In fact, we expect to have just about a quantitative amount of the dibenzyl acetone forming. Our goal in lab is going to be to verify this experimentally. So simply by changing the way that we're adding one reagent to another, we can create a situation where we make a different ratio of two of the same product.